Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome to Policy and Rights, the show about human rights and government policy. Welcome back everyone to Policy and Rights here on Depictions Media Radio. I am Michael Cloggs, your host. And we have update. Uh, from the Pan American Health Organization um, from their press conference on Wednesday. Uh, and opening statements were given by Dr. Barbosa. And he's saying it is critical for all of us to stay on course until everyone is vaccinated and protected from the virus. He said during the weekly media briefing on COVID-19, in the last week, countries reported more than 745,000 new COVID-19 infections and just over 18,000 deaths. The United States, Canada, and Mexico are reporting drops in cases and deaths as they have similar declines across um, the countries in Central America and South America. And He's attributing this to, to um, there have been about uh, 1.2 billion doses of COVID vaccine administered over 46% of the population of these regions. Um, further, um, in... Uh, We've been reporting on um, vaccine mandates uh, in in Canada and British Columbia, and it um, a number of health healthcare workers in British Columbia have been uh, put on leave because they um, either have not been vaccinated or have decided not to offer proof of that vaccination and in uh, two other um, provinces in Quebec and Ontario because of the crisis that these healthcare workers being asked uh, to go on leave until they comply with um, either proof, proof proving that they're vaccinated or being vaccinated um, that the these two provinces, uh, Ontario and Quebec, have decided to lift the uh, vaccine mandate on healthcare workers. Um, a lot of the reason is is because they want to make sure ensure that they don't lag behind in in life saving surgeries, surgeries that can help people get their life back on track again. And in British Columbia, a lot of those surgeries have been placed on hold, such as in the Ontario Health Minister gave an example of a hip replacement. They could put somebody back to work. In British Columbia, that surgery may not happen because the nurses and other healthcare workers they have not been vaccinated, they have been asked to, to go on leave until they comply. This slows down the process of getting people the medical treatment that they actually need. Um, in another report, um, the doctors, uh, doc one of the doctors associations in Ontario is outraged and is saying that the um, premier and health minister of Ontario, uh, of Ontario should not have um, abandoned the vaccine mandate on healthcare workers. So 
there's a, a lot of a lot of stress and everything around uh, vaccine mandates in the United States. Um, we have uh, President Joe Biden. He is giving the okay for um, ages five to twelve to to be vaccinated. So we're going to have school age children. They're going to be vaccinated. Uh, receive the vaccine uh, for COVID nineteen and. He uh, will have a clip of that also. So uh, let's start off with Dr. Barbosa and the uh, Pan American Health Organization and what they actually have to say. Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Diana, uh, welcome and thank you for joining today's briefing. Over the last week, the region of the Americas reported more than 745 to 20 new cases, new COVID-19 infections, and just over 18,000 COVID-related deaths. This is the eighth consecutive week that overall cases have declined in the region. In North America, all three counties reported drops in weekly cases and deaths, and there has been a notable decline in hospitalizations in the United States and Canada. There have been similar declines across most countries in Central America. After weeks of a persistent outbreak in Belize, I am pleased to report a nearly 20% decrease in cases and a 60% decrease in deaths. The same downward trends are present in bunch of South America. Save for a few exceptions that we are monitoring closely. In all countries, there are publishing data about the vaccination status of the hospitalized cases. A very high percentage of those hospitalized have not been immunized against the virus. Consistent with the other parts of the region, cases and deaths are trending downward or remaining stable throughout much of the Caribbean. However, Barbados continues to report its highest number of COVID-related infections and deaths since the start of the pandemic, and there are concerning shortages of hospital capacity in the Dominican Republic and Trinidad and Tobago. The progress in our region is not a reason to become complacent or discontinue the public health measures that help keep us safe. Quite the opposite. The declining cases and deaths shows that our approach is working, and it is critical for all of us to stay the course until everyone is vaccinated and protected from the virus. To date, 1.0 billion COVID vaccine doses have been administered across the Americas, and 46% of the population of Latin America and the Caribbean have been fully vaccinated, at least. 32 countries have already reached the WHO's target of 40% vaccination coverage, and several more are on track to reach and surpass it by the end of this year. This progress is encouraging, but not surprising, thanks to our region's strong immunization system. However, there are still several countries facing delays, and 19 that remain below the 40% target. But we're working closely with all these countries, especially Haiti, Nicaragua, Jamaica, St. Vincent and the Grenadines in Guatemala, which are still below 20% coverage. Vaccine inequity remains the biggest barrier to reaching our coverage target. The COVAX facility, with the support of Parros Revolving Fund, has delivered 64.3 million doses to the region. Roughly 30% of these vaccines, over 19 million doses, were donations by the United States, Spain, Canada, and other governments. We are thankful for these donations, which have improved the situation in the Americas. We continue to expect the allocation of the vaccines from COVAX to accelerate in the coming, coming weeks. 
so we urge countries to monitor the absorptive capacity and to continue to scale up vaccination operations. PAR is providing technical cooperation to our member states in all relevant aspects to guarantee successful vaccination. Communication strategy, training healthcare workers, adopting new strategies to facilitate the access of the population and producing capacity. We are also supporting countries to overcome supply problems with the ranges and dealings. That means we must make investments in immunization capacity and staffing a top priority. Our investments today will pave the way for a strong recovery after the pandemic. As more vaccines become available, countries need to make decisions about how to prioritize doses among their population. These decisions are ultimately up to individual countries based on the vaccination coverage and the availability of the vaccines they have, but should always be based on evidence, equity, and the commitment to protect our most vulnerable. So, I want to reinforce the latest guidance from the WHO Strategic Advisory Group of Experts on Immunization, SAGE, on a couple of key topics. The first is the bedrock of our vaccination strategy, that of vaccinating the most vulnerable. In some countries, we have seen vaccine doses reaching all levels of the population before a high percentage of vulnerable groups are fully immunized. Paro uses countries to prioritize the elderly, frontline workers, and people with pre existing conditions to protect them but also to prevent the health system from becoming overburdened with severe cases. This recommendation by say, an independent committee which advises WHO and PAHO is based on the most robust evidence available. When vaccine availability is low, it is best to protect the most vulnerable states. Once those at the greatest risk are protected, the next step is to immunize a high percentage of the adult population. Only afterward should the countries consider vaccinating younger groups. We have no evidence at this time that vaccinating students should be a prerequisite for reopening schools. This staged approach lays the best foundation for countries to reduce the circulation of the virus and eventually get their economies and societies back on track. The second is how to determine who needs an extra dose. Currently, we recommend providing an additional dose to only two groups. First, people who are immunocompromised, regardless of which vaccine they took. This includes cancer patients, HIV-positive individuals, people taking some medicines like corticoids and transplant recipients. And, over, and people over the age of 60 who received an inactivated virus vaccine, such as Sinovac or Sinopharm. These individuals need an additional dose to be protected from severe diseases and the risk of dying from COVID-19. And their vaccination cannot be considered complete until they have received their third shot. There is not enough evidence yet to recommend booster shots for other groups who are fully immunized, especially when vaccine availability is limited and many in our region still have not received their first shot. Our ability to quickly develop safe, effective vaccines against a new virus like COVID-19 has been a model of scientific innovation based on years of research and our rollout of this vaccine is based on our vast public health experience in immunization programs. PAHO continues to work tireless to make these vaccines available to everyone in the Americas. But we are aware that most countries in the region still don't have enough doses to protect all others, which makes it critical to follow expert guidance and maximize the impact of the doses that are available. Vaccination alone is not enough, but combined 
with effective public health measures, it is our best strategy for reducing COVID-19 transmission and saving lives. Thank you. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information. Today is a great day for American parents and American families and American children. We've taken a giant step forward to further accelerate our path out of this pandemic. After months of rigorous and independent scientific review, the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, authorized, and the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, recommended a COVID-19 vaccine for children ages 5 through 11. For parents all over this country, this is a day of relief and celebration. After almost 18 months of anxious worrying every time the children or your child had a sniffle or started to cough, well, you can now protect them from this horrible virus because that would always worry you that was what's coming along. 28 million more young Americans are now eligible for the protection of a vaccine. And my administration is ready. We're ready from day one, today, organized and have a plan for this vaccination's launch. As soon as next week, we'll have enough vaccine and enough places, and parents will be able to schedule appointments to get their kids their first shot. And we've already secured enough vaccine supply for every single child in America ages 5 through 11. And weeks ago, we asked states and pharmacies to put together their detailed plan to start placing their orders for these specially formulated vaccines for young children. We started packing and shipping these orders last week as soon as the FDA authorized the vaccine. We've already sent millions of doses, excuse me, <coughs> millions of doses and millions more to come by next week. These doses will be available at approximately, excuse me, <coughs> I beg your pardon, I swallowed wrong. will be available in approximately 20,000 locations around the country. These include places that parents know and trust, their local pharmacies, their pediatricians, family doctors, and children's hospitals. Many of the vaccine sites <coughs> will offer times on nights and weekends so parents can take their children to get vaccinated after work and after school. We've also been working with governors, mayors, and local school leaders to bring vaccines to schools. As of today, more than 6,000 school clinics have already been planned in school districts around the country. These efforts will also ensure equity that is the center of our children's vaccination program as it has been, as it has been the, the vaccination program for adults. We're making vaccines available at hundreds of community health centers, rural health clinics, and thousands of pharmacies and schools in our hardest hit communities. And we're sending out mobile units to reach where the people are. The bottom line is we've been planning and preparing for months to vaccinate our children. Our program will be ramping up this week and more doses shipped out each day so that we have fully, we are fully up and running by next week. Now, I know many parents have been anxiously waiting for this day. But I also know that some families might have questions. So, trusted mess messengers like your pediatricians, family doctors, will be able to answer your questions, talk to parents about the importance of their getting their kids vaccinated, and put your mind at ease. We'll also be raising awareness and encourage parents to get their children vaccinated from our level. Just when we've been doing, that's what we've been doing since day one of my administration. And we're going to do everything we can to make these vaccines easily available and raise awareness of the importance of getting vaccinated. So parents of children ages five and older, please get them vaccinated. Because here's the deal. Children make up one quarter of the cases in this country. And while rare, children can get very sick from COVID-19. And some can end up, few, but end up hospitalized. But they don't have to. This vaccine is safe and effective. So get your children vaccinated to protect themselves, to protect others, and to stop the spread and to help us beat this pandemic. Today, I also want to speak to uh, America's seniors. 
While everyone is at risk of getting COVID-19, the evidence is overwhelming that older Americans are still by far the most vulnerable to getting the sickest. And boosters, boosters add an important layer of protection. Booster shots are free and effective, and every senior should get one. It's important. Seniors are eligible to get your booster shot six months after you've been fully vaccinated. So six months. If you got your second shot before May the 1st, you are eligible to get the booster right now. And I've made it clear, we have ample supply of boosters. And thanks to our planning and preparation, our booster program is off to a very strong start. Over 20 million Americans have now received a booster. In fact, in just six weeks, we've already gotten boosters to about half the eligible seniors who received the Pfizer vaccine. Nearly half of the eligible seniors in just six weeks. It took nearly 11 weeks to get half of all seniors their first shot for that when that program was launched back in December of 2020, just during the prior administration. So as a, this is this a strong pace to our seniors, if you're eligible, get your booster now. I'll conclude with this. Vaccines for children ages 5 to 11 and boosters provide additional protection for seniors and others are two major steps forward that are going to accelerate our path out of this pandemic. And this brings, uh, this brings me to where we are and where we're going to go from here. Since early September, cases and hospitalizations are down now more than 50 percent. And over the past two weeks, cases and hospitalizations are falling in approximately 40 states. A year ago, we had no vaccines. Just this week, we hit an important milestone. 80 percent of adults have at least one shot. That's four out of every five adults. And for our seniors, over 95 percent have gotten at least one shot. Overall, 193 million Americans are fully vaccinated, up from just 2 million the day I was sworn in. Over 20 million have enhanced protections from boosters. And we're now down from 100 to about 60 million unvaccinated Americans 12 years and older. And I'm proud to say black and brown adults and Native Americans have gotten vaccinated at the same rate as white adults. And one more thing, our vaccination program is not only helping us save lives and beat the pandemic, it's helping our economic recovery and helping us grow. In the three months before I came to office, the economy was stagnant, creating only 60,000 jobs a month. Since I've taken office, it's now averaging 600,000 new jobs every month. That's the average. And one more thing, vaccinating our children will help us keep our schools open, keep our kids in the classroom, learning, socializing with their classmates and teachers. I think every reporter in this room who has a child understands the difference of a child going to school and having to learn from home. It matters. It matters in terms of their not just physical health and mental health. You know, during this pandemic, we've seen just how important being in school is for families and for our country. A year ago, we were heading into a Thanksgiving where public health experts were advising against traveling or gathering with family and friends. Last Thanksgiving, for the first time, just four of us, my wife and I, our daughter and, her, and my son-in-law. Later this month, our tables and our hearts are going to be filled thanks to the vaccines. We've made incredible progress over these past nine months, but we have to keep going. The pandemic is not yet behind us, yet behind us, but we're getting there. So please, please do your part. If you know someone who's not vaccinated, encourage them to get vaccinated. And folks, folks who haven't gotten vaccinated yet, please get vaccinated. It's easy, it's accessible, and it's free. Get vaccinated. You can do this. God bless you all, and I'll take a few questions. Mr. President, I'll start all the way at the end. Thank you, Mr. President. Appreciate it. Well, you're not all the way at the end, but that's okay. You're up. <laughs> um, as leader of the Democratic Party, how much responsibility do you take for the dismal results in Virginia and the Northwest? Well, look, yesterday reminded me of uh, that one of the sacred rights we have is to be able to go out and cast our votes. And remember that we all have an obligation to accept the legitimacy of these elections. 
I was talking to Terry to congratulate him today. He got 600,000 more votes than any Democrat ever has gotten. We brought out every Democrat about there was more votes that ever has been cast for a Democratic incumbent. I'm not incumbent, a Democrat running for governor. And no governor in Virginia has ever won when he's of the same or he or she's the same party as the sitting president. What I do know is, I do know that people want us to get things done. They want us to get things done. And that's why I'm continuing to push very hard for the Democratic Party to move along and pass my infrastructure bill and my Build Back Better bill. I think if we look, think about what, we, what we're talking about here. People are upset and uncertain about a lot of things, from COVID to school to jobs to a whole range of things and the cost of the, the, a gallon of gasoline. And so if I'm able to pass sign of the law, my Build Back Better initiative, I'm in a position where you're going to see a lot of those things ameliorated quickly and swiftly. And so that has to be done. Responsibility, and do you think that Terry McAuliffe would have won if your agenda had passed before election day? Well, uh, I think we should have it sh should have passed before election day, but I'm not sure that I would be able to have changed the number of very conservative folks who turned out in the red districts who were Trump voters. But maybe, you maybe. Won the state by 10 points, Mr. No, I, I I know we did, but I we also. I was running against Donald Trump. Thank you, Mr. President. What should Democrats possibly do differently to avoid similar losses in November, especially as Republicans are now successfully running on culture war issues and false claims about critical race theory? Well, I think we should produce for the American people. Look, one of the things that is important to understand, if, uh, if they pass my legislation, we're going to be able to reduce the price. People are going to see a reduction in the price of the drugs they, they have to get because Medicare will be able to negotiate and lower the price of drugs. If they pass my legislation, you're going to see that nobody, and some of you who have children in, uh, in, in daycare or children in child care, you're paying up to $14,000 a year if you live here. You will never have to pay that much money if you live in Washington or wherever you live. Not more than 17% of your income. They're going to see that, uh, you know, uh, they'll get tax breaks, uh, genuine tax breaks. If that's Trump, to tell them I'm busy. <laughs> bad, bad joke. But anyway, but the, but, 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 but the point is that, you know, we have to move and make it clear that what we've done is increasing their little look. People, people need a little breathing room. They're overwhelmed. And what happened was... Uh, I think we have to just produce results for them to change their standard of living and give them a little more breathing room. My question is, <laughs> what's your message, though, for Democratic voters, especially black voters, who see Republicans running on race, education, lying about critical race theory, and they're worried that Democrats don't have an effective way to push back on that? Well, I think that uh, the whole answer is just to speak the truth, lay out where we are. Look, um, I'm convinced that if you look at everything from my view on the criminal justice system to my view on equal opportunity to my view on economic issues and all the things that I have and what I've been pushing in legislation, each of the elements are overwhelmingly popular. We have to speak to them, though. We have to speak to them and explain them. Look. I just think people are at a point, and it's understandable, where there's a whole lot of confusion. Everything from, are you going to ever get COVID under control, to, are my kids going to be in school, are they going to be able to stay in school, to whether or not uh, um, I'm going to get a tax break that allows me to be able to pay for the needs of my kids and my family. And they're all things that we're that we're gonna that I'm running on, that we'll run on, and I think we'll do fine. Mr. President, uh, Mr. President, this ought to be good. I I, I think so too. Uh, about the way forward, Mr. President, 
As you were leaving for your overseas trip, there were reports that were surfacing that your administration is planning to pay illegal immigrants who are separated from their families at the border up to $450,000 each, possibly a million dollars per family. Do you think that that might incentivize more people to come over illegally? If you guys keep sending that garbage out, yeah, but it's not so, true. So this is a garbage report? Yeah. Okay. So $450,000. $450, Per person, is that what you're saying? That was separated from a family member at the border under under the last administration. That's not going to happen. Okay, and then just to follow up, because you mentioned Trump a couple times, when you went to try to help Terry McAuliffe in uh, a couple weeks ago before you left, you mentioned Trump 24 times. Do you still think that voters really want to hear you talking about Trump more than the issues affecting them every day? Well. The reason I mentioned Trump, if I didn't count the times, is because the issues he supports are affecting their lives every day and there are negative impact on their lives. Am I being Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. No, we uh, decided that this is the, the right decision for right now here in Ontario. While individual hospitals can make their own determination, uh, member, we had to really do a, a risk Council. assessment, taking a look at the, uh, the answers that we received from the many uh, groups that the uh, Premier sent the letter to, as well as what's going on on the ground in other jurisdictions. And we know that uh, in British Columbia, for example, they've had uh, to cancel some of their scheduled surgeries because they've got about 3,300 workers that uh, are out on leave now and uh, are being requested to have vaccinations. And uh, Quebec has just announced that they are uh, taking another look at their original uh, mandatory vaccination policy. So we, we took a, lot, a look at that and the, uh, the concern that we had that we would lose some of our uh, precious health human resources compared to a relatively small number of outbreaks. And that's why the determination was made not to proceed with a mandatory policy at this time, although we're continuing to watch the numbers every day and we'll see what happens as we go further into the winter. Are there any particular areas in the province you are concerned about? Because if you look at UHN, for example, they've had a lot of success with their mandatory vaccine policy. We heard from from uh, different groups, depending on where they are in the province of Ontario. Some places are really struggling more with health human resources than other areas. But that's something, one of the, the primary concerns that we needed to take into consideration because we don't want to have to cancel surgeries in Ontario. We've been very fortunate that we've been able to keep those surgeries going, even though we still have thousands of people that are waiting for those surgeries for hip and knee replacements, which are uh, painful for people, prevent some people from being able to work, uh, cataract surgeries and so on. People have been waiting long enough, and so as government, we have a responsibility to uh, protect the health and well-being of all Ontarians. And so that's why this decision is is the right decision for Ontario right now. Minister, where is the where is the premier's claim of tens of thousands of healthcare workers coming from? Not just ten thousand, but tens, plural, tens of thousands of healthcare workers would be out of their job. Uh, where is that number coming from? Well, that uh, was a number that uh, was based on the uh, Premier's understanding of the situation before the uh, letter was uh, sent out. We know that there would be some significant job losses if we were to proceed with mandatory vaccination right now. But we still support the decisions of individual hospitals to do as they see best. And I would really point to some of the pediatric hospitals for that uh, because they are dealing with very vulnerable uh, patients that um, haven't, don't have the opportunity yet to be vaccinated, although we hope that we will receive approval from Health Canada very shortly for that. So, the, so if the tens of thousands, that's the phrase, if the tens of thousands is coming from the time before the letter to hospitals asking for information went out. Is that not now obsolete information? Why has it been repeated today? Do you, do you believe it's going to be ten, tens of thousands? I know that it could be very significant 
And that is why we want to be able to maintain our health human resources so that we can care for the people with COVID, of course, but also care for all of the other people who've been waiting for surgeries. And we've got thousands of surgeries that are waiting, not to mention diagnostic procedures. And we know that what we're seeing in our hospitals right now are patients that are more acutely ill because to some extent we've had to postpone some of those diagnostic procedures. We want to be able to keep those going so that we'll be able to treat people in, a, in an earlier stage of an illness so that they can become well. Mr. Can you understand you've from you've heard from uh, hospital CEOs who told you don't do this. I'll run out of staff. I'll have significant staff problems. Yes, we have. And even though the hospital association, the letter that we've seen, says the vast majority of hospital CEOs, I think 120 of 140, uh, uh, representing 90 something percent of all the staff in the province, said go go for it. That's, yes, that's correct. The Ontario Hospital was in favor of mandatory vaccination policies, but there were some individual hospitals that did indicate to us that they were very concerned about um, uh, loss of uh, health human resources. Yes. Which, which hospitals are they in rural northern areas? Were these letters made public? No, I'm not able to provide that publicly, but I can tell you that there were hospitals in that situation. Can you help us understand the disconnect here? On the very same day that you're telling nearly three million Ontarians you need to go out and get a third dose of the vaccine, you are telling a significant number of health care providers it is okay to not even get one dose of the vaccine. A lot of people would look at that and say that that does not make sense. Can you help me understand why you would say to health care workers you don't even need to get a dose of the vaccine, don't worry about it? We're certainly not saying that. We have been urging everyone in Ontario, particularly he frontline healthcare workers, to please go and get vaccinated. We've said that from the beginning. We will continue to say that. That's the best way to protect individuals, families, and communities. So, but in that in situation where there are some who are not being vaccinated, we still have very rigorous testing procedures there for the protection of their patients and the families that come in that they will need to undergo a rigorous PCR testing to make sure that they are healthy and won't transmit COVID to any other patients. What do you say then as the Minister of Health, because ultimately whether or not you're encouraging somebody to get the vaccine, you're still giving all of these healthcare workers a provincial pass. So what do you say to a patient who, you know, you're saying to them, hey, your health comes first, but also your health may not come first because an unvaccinated employee can have direct contact with you. What do you say to patients as the health minister about whether or not you're actually putting their health first? What I would say is that from the beginning, the health and well-being of all Ontarians has been our priority and it continues to be. And so it's the patients that we are protecting by having the employees tested frequently for, for COVID, but also for the thousands of patients who have been waiting for well over a year to have procedures done that are painful and debilitating, hips and knee replacements, um, cataract surgeries and other surgeries. We want to make sure that we, we can move forward with that because it's while it's terrible to lose someone from COVID, it's also terrible to lose someone from something that hasn't been diagnosed early enough or hasn't been operated on soon enough. So that is why we're taking the entire population. Senior citizen, a vulnerable city, senior citizen who might have underlying health concerns, they will still be treated by, they can still be treated by an unvaccinated healthcare worker. Is that correct? That's correct, but only a, a worker who has been tested regularly to make sure that they are safe and that they are healthy. That is a paramount consideration and will continue to be. Minister, are you going to put out any of this data so we can actually see what hospitals or, or even what regions are, are even having issues with staffing or to actually back up some of these claims? The information that was provided uh, subsequent to the Premier's letter is was provided in confidence and so we're not able to produce it publicly. We'll go to the phone lines for the last question. Your last question comes from Randy Rath with CHCH TV. Please go ahead. Hi Randy. Yeah, hi Minister. Um, I'm wondering what this means for other businesses that have implemented vaccine mandates for their employees, like the TTC, um, any other industry that has, has, has a mandate in place. 
Well, it's really up to employers to uh, require vaccination or not. I know that many of the uh, large companies in Ontario have done that, but it's also open to individual hospitals still in Ontario to decide whether they are going to require mandatory vaccinations, and some of them have, and we'll allow that to continue. Doesn't this send an, an incredibly um, mixed message to to people that, 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 that are asked for their vaccine passport, their vaccine proof, when they go into a, into a business? Hasn't this just opened up a whole can of worms for the for, for, for businesses that are telling people they can't come in? But, Oh, this is this is based. We're we're dealing with healthcare in Ontario, as I said before. This is the right decision for right now, but we're going to continue to monitor it, and especially as we go into colder weather, with more and more people being being indoors, we'll continue to review it to see if it remains the right decision for Ontario. If we're seeing an uh, increased uptake, uh, then and especially in workplaces in hospitals, then we will need to revisit it. But right now, this is the right decision because it allows us to continue with our responsibility to protect the health and well-being of everyone in the province. Thanks, so, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Um, and then we will have uh, Monica, the spokesperson for the President of the General Assembly. Um, the Secretary General is now heading back to New York. A few hours ago, he was at Pembroke College at Cambridge University, where he engaged in public discussion with students and faculty on ethics and climate change. The Secretary General underscored the need to truly listen and engage with young people, as they are the biggest allies for climate action. It is ethically un indefensible not to take future generations into account, he told them. He encouraged students and young activists to continue to work, shout, and mobilize so that we can have effective action against climate change. The full event can be seen online. Today is Energy Day at COP26. The Secretary General's Special Representative um, for Sustainable Energy for All, Damilola Ogunbi, presented the Secretary General's Global Roadmap to Achieve Clean Energy for All by 2030 and Net Zero Emissions by 2050 as an outcome of September's high-level dialogue on energy. Bless you. The roadmap calls for 500 million more people to have access to electricity in just four years' time by 2025, as well as 1 billion more people to get access to clean cooking. It also urges a tripling of annual investment for renewable energy and energy efficiency globally by 2030. A new report by the UN Environment a program calls for urgent efforts to increase the financing and implementation of actions designed to adapt to the growing impacts of climate change. The Adaptation Gap report found that while policies and planning are growing for climate change adaptation, financing and in implementation are still far behind where they need to be. In addition, the report finds that the opportunity to use the fiscal recovery from the pandemic to prioritize green economic growth is largely being missed, as fewer than one-third of 66 countries funded COVID-19 recovery measures to address climate risks. You can find the full report online. Uh, and today at COP26, the UN World Tourism Organization, the UN Environment Program and Partners launched the Glasgow Declaration for Climate Action and Tourism with more than 300 businesses in the tourism industry and governments committing to cut emissions in half by 2030 and achieve net zero by 2050 at the latest. The Glasgow Declaration recognizes the urgent need for a globally consistent plan for climate action and tourism. Signatories commit to measure, decarbonize, regenerate and unlock finance. Additionally, each signatory commits to deliver a concrete climate action plan or updated plan within 12 months of signing. You can find the full list of those who signed the declaration online. And also at COP26, the UN's highest level humanitarian, humanitarian coordination forum, which is called the Interagency Standing Committee, issued a statement today, uh, yesterday sorry, urging world leaders gathered at the climate summit in Glasgow to prioritize the most vulnerable and at-risk countries and communities in their decision-making. 
the 21 signatories, including the UN's emergency relief coordinator and the principals of 11 UN organizations, say that the climate crisis disproportionately affects communities that also face conflict, violence, poverty, and COVID-19, and in particular, women and girls. These vulnerable populations have limited capacity to cope with shocks and adapt to climate change and risk being left further behind. The full statement is available on the IASC website. And I have a readout of the Secretary General's phone call with Lieutenant General Abdel Fattah al burhan the Commander of the Armed Forces of the Republic of Sudan. He encouraged the, uh, the Secretary General encouraged the development of all efforts towards resolving the political crisis in Sudan and urgently restoring the constitutional order in Sudan's transitional process. The Secretary General reiterated his call for the release of Prime Minister Abdullah Hamduk and other civilians arbitrarily detained in Sudan. The Secretary General reaffirmed that the United Nations will continue to stand with the people of Sudan as they strive to fulfill their aspirations for a peaceful, prosperous, and democratic future. On Ethiopia, you will have seen that yesterday the Secretary General tweeted that he is very concerned about the evolution of the situation there. He spoke with Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed to offer his good offices to create the conditions for a dialogue so that the fighting stops. The Secretary General said that they also discussed the forthcoming visit to Ethiopia by the UN Emergency Relief Coordinator, Martin Griffiths, to ensure humanitarian assistance for those who desperately need life-saving aid. Mr. Griffiths is expected to be on mission to Ethiopia from tomorrow. He will engage with relevant stakeholders to ensure that aid reaches those who need it. Uh, and we're moving to Afghanistan. The Director General of the International Organization for Migration, Antonio Vitorino, concluded a visit to the country. In a statement, he warned that as the bitter winter approaches, there is a real risk that the deteriorating humanitarian situation will result in increased displacement, vulnerability, and suffering, and that the modest social and development gains of the past two decades will be lost. Mr. Vitorino noted that five and a half million people are internally displaced in Afghanistan, which is roughly the population of Finland. He stressed that we are indeed in a race against time to help these people prepare for winter and that IOM is committed to staying and delivering in full solidarity with the Afghan people. On the humanitarian front, our colleagues tell us that between September 1st and October 15th, we, along with our partners, have provided 4.1 million people with food assistance, and we have reached more than 580,000 people with primary health care services. We have also provided treatment for acute malnutrition to more than 85,000 children, assisted nearly 200,000 drought-affected people with water trucking, and reached more than 48,000 children with community-based education activities. Our humanitarian colleagues tell us that dialogue is ongoing at every level to ensure the full and meaningful participation of women in humanitarian action. Between the 2nd of September and the 28th of October, the number of provinces in which full agreement has been secured regarding the participation of women has increased from 13 to uh, sorry from 3 to 14. The number of provinces in which partial agreement has been secured has increased from 16 to 19. Also today, the UN Children's Fund said that nine members of one family, including four girls and two boys, were reportedly killed yesterday morning when an explosive remnant of war detonated inside a home in Kunduz. Three other children were injured. UNICEF said that this incident underlines the urgent imperative to clear explosive ordnance and remnants of war and to sensitize communities to the risk. The UN Special Envoy for Yemen, Hans Grumberg, concluded a visit to Iran yesterday. He met with senior Iranian officials and representatives of the international community in Tehran. During his meetings, Mr. Grumberg emphasized the need to, uh, for support of UN efforts to reach a negotiated settlement to the conflict. Mr. Grumberg expressed his serious concern over the escalating military activities in Yemen, which are causing significant civilian casualties, including children, and are undermining peace efforts. He underscored the urgent need for de-escalation in all of Yemen, including Marib. He further discussed the need to address the deteriorating humanitarian and economic situation in Yemen and the importance of ensuring freedom of movement of people and goods into and throughout the country. Meanwhile, the UN and partners have continued to provide life-saving assistance to civilians affected by conflict in Marib, al Baida, and Shabwa since the escalation of fighting in these governments in September this year. In October, aid agencies provided assistance on both sides of the front lines, including food aid to 2,100 families in al Abdiya district, 12,400 families in the Al-Wadi area of Mahrib, and 40,000 families in Mahrib city. 
Additionally, the UN Population Fund has delivered emergency relief to newly displaced persons affected by the fighting in Marib and surrounding governance. In October, nearly 100,000 displaced people received assistance that included hygiene items, ready-to-eat food rations, and female dignity kits. The UN continues to call for an end to military escalations and has been engaging with the parties to the conflict to ensure that aid partners have the necessary access to civilians stranded between rapidly shifting front lines. And today, the UN Special Coordinator for Lebanon, Joanna Vernetska, visited the areas of Zale and the West Bekaa in eastern Lebanon. She met with local authorities and toured a development project, an educational institution, an informal tented site for Syrian refugees. The impact of the crisis on the people of the Bekaa, just like in other Lebanese areas, is very serious and requires immediate solutions, the Special Coordinator said, after meeting separately with local authorities in Zale and in West Bekaa. She welcomed steps taken at the local level to address urgent needs. And we have an update from our team in Cuba, which has been supporting authorities and the population to address the health and social economic, socioeconomic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. The months of July and August marked a pandemic peak in the country, placing extreme pressure on the health system. The UN team boosted its support to health services with diagnostic and protection measures, importing oxygen concentrators, ox uh, oximeters, and installing oxygen plants. During July, August, and September, the UN team delivered over 1.4 million items, including gloves, surgical masks, and syringes, as well as 100,000 COVID-19 tests, and nearly 100 WHO-certified refrigerators to safely store vaccines. Our socioeconomic response with authorities focused on increasing food production capacity. More than 65,000 people have received food items. The UN also boosted efforts to increase vaccination and to continue preventing the spread of the disease through a communication campaign that involves several UN agencies. And the Food and Agricultural Organization today said that the world food price barometer surged to a new peak, reaching its highest level since July of 2011. In October, the FAO food price index went up 3% from September, rising for a third consecutive month. FAO notes that despite an expected rec uh, record world cereal production in 2021, global cereal stocks are set to decline in 2021 and 2022. And lastly, tomorrow we will be joined by Mr. Nicholas Kumjian, uh, the head of the Independent Investigative Mechanism for Myanmar. He will update you on the current situation in that country. And that's it for me. Edie. Uh, thank you, Ari. A couple of follow-ups. Um, first, um, on Sudan, we know that the U.S. Special Envoy has arrived. Um, can you tell us what Mr. Perthes is doing? Is he in meeting, shuttling back and forth? Um, Mr. Perthes continues his dialogue with um, all stakeholders, um, not just the military um, and, you know, the, the government, but also with, um, with other member, uh, members in, uh, with other uh, groups in Sudan. Um, we believe that he is in contact with the Americans, but um, as we've said, we welcome all efforts, not just by us, of course, but by um, other parties to ensure um, a return to the transitional government. And on Ethiopia, the Secretary General offered his good offices. What was the reaction of President Abiy uh, to his offer? Was there any sign that he might take up the UN's offer? Sure. This was a pre preliminary offer, um, and we obviously don't want to speak on behalf of the Ethiopians, but we will continue to pursue this and see um, uh, where it can take us and hopefully it will lead to some good results. Thank you. Does anybody else in the room have questions? Nabil. Yes, uh, so, uh, Sudan again, um, can you describe more how was, how was the conversation with Mr. Burhan? Uh, what was the SG's impression about uh, his uh, maybe uh, plans or willingness to uh, to engage on the, the, the releasing of Mr. Hamdouk and the other civilians. 
Uh, you know, um, the phone call just happened a short while ago. wasn't there. Um, but um, we can only tell you what, you know, the Secretary General said from his side. Um, you know, we hope that the Secretary General's calls will be, you know, taken to heart and will be acted upon. Um, but um, it's not just the Secretary General. You know, we have our special representative on the ground, Mr. Perthes, um, and um, contacts at all levels to ensure that um, we get our message across and that we hope um, that our pleas are acted upon. And also on, the, on a different matter, uh, the, the tension is rising between Morocco and Algeria. And now Algeria accuses Morocco of uh, targeting uh, a convoy of uh, its citizens in the Sahara. Um, is the SG planning to take any action to avoid uh, further escalation, uh, to prevent uh, the situation from getting uh, more tense? I mean, the Secretary General is obviously aware of um, the situation that you just mentioned. Um, as you know, he would urge and does urge um, dialogue to ensure that these tensions are lessened. Um, and we look forward to the start of the work of our new special envoy um, to you know, take the temperature on the ground and see how he can um, help to improve the situation. Um, last follow-up, did he uh, deliver this message directly to any of the other two parties? I'm not aware that he's delivered the message directly, but um, the message, I'm sure, is being delivered um, through our various mechanisms at different levels. Thanks. And do we have anybody in the room? Okay, um, from the screen, James, are you there? Hi, Harry. Can you Hi. hear me? Yes, how are you? Hi, there. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I've got a COP26 question. A report just came out from the International Energy Agency, and this says that if all the, if you top together all the methane reduction pledges and the net zero pledges, and if all the countries stick to their promises, we're now looking at only 1.8 degrees Celsius of temperature rise. Given that you guys were a week ago talking about 2.7 degrees this century, this number kind of makes Glasgow look like a big win. My question is, do you guys make the same calculation? Are we now looking at 1.8? Um, we've seen these reports. You know, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change um, analyzes um, our data and um, uh, based on the impact of the national determined contributions that are submitted. And uh, the UNFCC's most recent analysis shows that we are still on the calamitous pathway for 2.7 degrees uh, centigrade. Um, as you know, the Secretary General has said every country must increase its ambition, not every five years, but every year until we are on track for 1.5 degrees centigrade. Thanks. Uh, Iftikhar, do you have a question? Oh, thanks, Eddie. Uh, I was going to ask uh, you about the Secretary General's go good office's office uh, offer to Ethiopian Prime Minister, but Eddie has already asked the question. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Uh, you've been listening to Policy and Rights, and I am your host, Michael Cloggs. We hope that the information that we provide you does actually help uh, you decide which, which you're going to do, whether to be vaccinated or not to be vaccinated, rather to go to the restaurant or not to go to the restaurant, or how you decide you want to help people stand up for human rights and what you want to say back to your elected officials about what it is that you see happening in your community. The whole point is we all need to be involved in our community. We need to receive accurate information about what government is doing and what the issues are in our community. That means getting involved. And we hope that you do get involved in our community that we, and that you become an active part so that you understand what is going on with your neighbors so that you can lend a helping hand.
Thank you for listening today, and thank you for supporting us with our sponsors. Please go to depictions.media for more information, and click on our contact link and let us know how we can help, how we can help bring your story and help bring us to a better world. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.